Okay. Um, so I guess I'll just I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Travis Doerr. I'm a PhD student at uh, University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. I'm a student of Jackie Narnia Hosler. And today I'll be going through some work that we've done. Um, a good chunk of it will be a recent paper that came out where we uh, looked at uh, how far from equilibrium behavior um, affects the, the search for the QCD critical point. Um, but I also have included some results on some other things too. So we'll be I'll be also be talking about first kind of an overview at mu b equals zero to kind of get us going. And uh, then I'll also at the end talk about some future work that we're working on right now to get us towards, really towards where the B manages scan um, physics is important and trying to model that physics the right way. Um, I should mention this is work done with a lot of different people in our group. Um, um, Deborah, uh, Deborah Mochek, she did a lot of work on the equation of state. Lydia Spicella also did work on the, 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 the 4D equation of state that we'll be using at the beam energy scan. She did made a wonderful root finder that works really well um, because that, the mapping is quite non-trivial when you have four dimensions. Uh, and then McLaughlin was, a, was an, REU, an REU student that worked with Jackie this summer and, and she worked really hard to get uh, the shear viscosity that we ended up using in, um, in, in both mu b equals zero and greater than mu b actually for the hydro runs. Um, Jackie obviously had a pivotal role in this. Matt did, uh, Matt Sievert, he's over at, at, at New Mexico State right now. He's got a job over there as a professor. He has a lot of work with the icing. Uh, the icing stuff that I'll talk a little bit about and uh, Dekra, Dekra Yatz and Christopher are uh, new postdocs that just joined our group and they're currently uh, working with me to, uh, to get um, hydro running with a PSQ for for, for, for the beam energy scan stuff, but we'll get there, we'll talk about it. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll just start by, in case anyone's here is not familiar with the heavy ion collision, I didn't really know exactly what the audience was gonna be like, but talk a little bit about the different stages of a heavy ion collision, just to kind of catch everybody up. Uh, so first you have your initial state. Uh, so basically at, at RIC or, LH, or LHC, right? Which is in Long Island or Geneva, Switzerland, basically get these heavy ions or these nuclei going around really fast and we crash them into each other at really fast speeds, right? Um, and they're going fast enough that here they're, 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 uh, they're shown as pancakes, like really kind of flat pancakes because they, they are Lorentz contracted in the, in, the, in the rest frame of the lab. Um, they smash into each other, deposit a ton of energy. And, and uh, so that, 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 that's the initial state that we try to, to quantify. And that overlaps obviously into the aftermath and the hydrodynamic evolution. Um, so basically after that, after these two heavy ions collide, they deposit a ton of energy, like I said, and that, that energy evolves hydrodynamically. Um, and so a lot of this, a lot of this talk will be, will be, will be focused on that aspect. And if you notice that I do have like all of these different stages overlapping here, it's because there's a lot of uncertainty actually, like where, you know, the initial state ends and where the hydro begins, right? And you might have some process that takes you from the initial state to the hydro, and it may have some hydro, hydrodynamization process. And here in the freeze out, uh, here on the phase transition side, the, the picture is similar. You might have chemical freeze out, but then the particles will still be interacting kinetically and that might um, give a hydro picture or it also might give a Boltzmann equation picture. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty in these regions, um, but the theoretical challenge is creating a hybrid model that's kind of all consistent, that connects the initial state to the aftermath and the hydro to the hydronization phase transition, the freeze out. And then ultimately all that is measured as charged particles and momentum space. And you notice that these are connected, and there's kind of a disconnect here. And that's because the main challenge is really connecting these theoretical hybrid models, complicated hybrid models to what we see in the experimental data, right? Because at the end of the day, the data is the data and there's lots of unknowns going on here and a lot of parameters. And it's not always clear how to map exactly the physics we are trying to model here to the data here, right? So, this is going to be kind of um, bridge and talking about that. So let's talk about LHC vanishing baryon chemical potential. <clears throat> so at Rick and LHC at the really at the highest energies, um, the, the nuclei actually punch right through each other and they just only deposit energy in their wake or just gluons. Um, and this, this, this uh, many body QCD matter is only a function of temperature then, right? Because there's no conserved, there's no, there's no baryons deposited or anything else, right? So it's only a function of temperature. Um, if you know anything about phase transitions, you see here that the pressure is quite smooth, right? So when we say that we're 
uh, looking for the critical points, right? See effects for the QCD critical. We're looking for an out of state, uh, out of equilibrium uh, effects on the on the search for the QCD critical point. Um, we're talking about uh, discontinuities. In, in the pressure, right? In the first derivative in the pressure would be a first order phase transition. A discontinu discontinuity in the second derivative of the pressure would be a second order phase transition, right? We see here that it's quite smooth and continuous. So this, what this is telling you is that QCD um, at, at zero, a vanishing chemical potential, a vanishing baryon chemical potential is a crossover phase transition. So it's not a real phase transition in a traditional sense. What it means is that your, your degrees of freedom are changing continuously from um, um, deconfined quarks and gluons into confined hadrons. Uh, and that's interesting in its own right, um, but um, not going to be the, the focus of the, of the QCD critical point. However, it is important to understand the physics of what's going on here before we can start to untangle the effects of criticality, right? So the idea is that if we understand things that at vanishing baryon chemical potential fully, then we could start to understand things at large values of chemical potential. And as I said, the energy deposition evolves hydrodynamically. Um, so yeah, a lot of this, this talk is focused on that aspect, right? So viscous hydro with no conserved charges has historically done very well to describe low big T particles for a broad range of collision energies and a broad range of collision systems as well, I should add. Um, I didn't add that in here, but a broad range of collision systems from large lead lead systems to small systems like something like P lead or proton lead or, or, or or helium-3, helium-3, something like this, they all respond quite well, uh, can be described quite well by hydrodynamics in a low PT regime. Um, there's many models on the market. The USB Hydro um, was, was pioneered by, by my advisor, Jackie. There's also, uh, that's, that's a SPH. Uh, this is different than, than the other hydro uh, models on, on the market because it's a smooth part of a hydrodynamics model. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, not too important right now. These other two, Music and IBE Vishnu are, uh, are involved are uh, grid codes, um, but they're also involved in kind of, well, Vishnu is a package that kind of evolves you from initial state all the way to hadronization and, and freeze out. And music is a part of a package where typically is, uh, as you can see here, I can be Glasma plus music plus your QMD, part of a package that evolves you from initial state all the way to freeze out. Um, but so current efforts are going on to constrain these initial conditions for the hydro. Um, so that's a big problem at mu b equals zero is, is constraining the initial conditions. We can describe things like the low PT part, low PT uh, spectra pretty well, um, but however, kind of constraining what the initial conditions for the hydro should be um, is kind of a, is a challenge right now for a few reasons that we'll talk about. Um, so how do we start talking about far from equilibrium hydro? Um, if you know anything about hydrodynamics, you know that it's a it's, a, it's an effective theory for, um, for, for, for slow modes, right? That is that like your system should be something like close to equilibrium and 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 mo modes that are kind of like like smaller wave like modes that are that uh, higher energy modes kind of like take you away from that. It's kind of a simple way to say it. Um, right. So uh, so how do attractors fit into this? Well, it seems to be that it's a robust feature of kinetic theory and different hydrodynamic formulations. Um, so we see that if you initialize your system in many different far from equilibrium states, they collapse onto some universal curve on very short timescales. Um, so the existence of these attractors is actually makes far from equilibrium hydrodynamics plausible because your, your system quickly converges from a far from equilibrium state to something that can be described well by hydrodynamics. And it makes it even likely in small systems. So, so as I was saying before, uh, hydrodynamics has done really well to describe things like helium three, which is a helium three helium three collisions or helium three lead collisions, which is, um, which is really uh, a smaller system than something like a lead lead collision. Right? There's not as much there's not as much nuclei there. Uh, there's not as much material there. And you would expect there to be to be large gradients. You would expect that your system looks something, uh, I guess, like this, like really bumpy, right? Not very smooth, very bumpy initial conditions. And why should that? Why should you expect something that 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 has large gradients to be be, be described well by hydrodynamics? Uh, well, if there's these attractors that exist, then that might be one way of explaining that. But in a way, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because if a track, because it's a blessing because attractors offer us a means to explain these robust predictions, um, given the far from equilibrium initial state, right? 
However, by their very nature, these attractors imply memory loss of the system initial condition. So if we want to constrain those initial conditions, because that's, that's physics that we're interested in, right? Like what is the initial state of the system before we detect it? It makes it really hard to, to detect those. It makes it really hard to put theoretic constraints on those initial conditions, because if our system loses memory of that, then we won't see the neural measurements, right? So, okay. We might ask the question then, how does this look for a toy model hydro with a realistic equation of state? Because um, a lot of the work that had been done so far in attractors, to my knowledge, had been usually um, equations of states that aren't really associated with QCD, right? And usually toy model, maybe conformal hydro. Um, the, the, goal, the goal of this work was really to kind of to kind of start pushing that a little bit in the direction of realistic, realistic models. Um, so first we'll take a look at the, what the hydro will be, well, the hydro equations we'll be talking about here. Um, this formula, this, so these are really two different formalisms of hydrodynamics, um, Israel Stewart versus DNMR. They're quite similar actually. So it might, it might be, if you're not familiar, it might be a little bit confusing because they look, it can be kind of the same. The DNMR equations are here on the right and the Israel Stewart equations are here on the left. Um, and you'd be right because they, they, they do look really similar. And the point is that they're both independent. They're, they, they're both equations that describe independent and dynamic viscous currents that relax to Navier-Stokes values before equilibrium. And they're both in a sense, well, the NMR really is and Israel Stewart in a sense, second order theory in Knudsen and inverse Reynolds number. So they are very, very similar hydrodynamic theories. Um, and when I say toy model, uh, a toy model of hydro, I really mean this. We're going to have these relaxation equations, but we're going to apply a boost invariant symmetry as well as a, a polar symmetry. So it's a really a Bjorken flow is really the toy model that we're going to be using. Um, but the difference, the, the main difference between these, these, these two formulations, the biggest difference is really the transfer coefficients um, and what gets encoded into those. Um, so this is going to be the, the hydro that I'm using throughout this talk. So here's a, here's a case, um, kind of like a less physical case. We did use a, an equation of state, a physical equation of state. Um, this is a, a, an equation, of, a QCD equation of state calculated in the lattice at mu b equals zero. Um, and you can see that there is attracting behavior. Uh, so your shear viscosity falls like, uh, falls like epsilon plus p and your, your bulk viscosity as well, but it also has some speed of sound dependence. Um, but you see that they, they do kind of converge onto some universal curve before their Navier Stokes. So here the Navier Stokes are kind of like these black curves, right? And you see that they converge onto some universal curve before that. Um, so good. So, okay. So we already include some realism. We include some realistic equation of state and we see that attractors are kind of persisting, but this is a constant relaxation time, right? So that's still an assumption that we're making. So, and we know that the, 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 the relaxation time um, for, 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 for heavy ion collisions probably should not be constant, right? Um, so one can then try to relax that assumption and take the case of physically motivated transfer coefficients. So here on the left, is, um, this is actually our eight over S as a function of time, as a function of, of tau, which is the time variable in the Bjorken flow. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here is that there is this late time rise uh, in the viscosity. So actually as a, function of as a function of temperature, this thing, that means the shear viscosity rises at low temperatures. Um, and at decently high temperatures, it also uh, rises slightly there, right? So your system sort of starts in a higher temperature state. And as the system evolves, the temperature decreases and, it, and eventually your eight over S sees a minimum of about of 0 0.08. And then it rises again after the transition. Um, and that's gonna be important to keep in mind for interpreting results. And this uh, bulk viscosity, uh, so we know the bulk viscosity should be there because uh, the QCD, uh, QCD is a not, uh, uh, the QCD equation of state describes a non-conformal, uh, non a system with non-conformal symmetry. It doesn't have conformal symmetry. Uh, so we know that the system can have a bulk viscosity. Um, so we kind of took something inspired from, from this paper here. It's kind of a holographic inspired um, bulk viscosity. Um, just something to see the effects here. So physically motivated transport coefficients in some sense. Uh, sorry, may I have a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, here, what is what? What are the ranges of temperature? Ah, good uh, question. Um, the range of temperature are, I would say, the system start about three hundred or so MeV, and then it would, and then the hydro is evolved until about one hundred and ten MeV. Thank you. 
Yeah, so it's about a range of two to three hundred MeV, I would say. The hydro has evolved to uh, the hydro has evolved into uh, to to all the way to one ten MeV, and then um, I believe it was something like three on the order of three hundred MeV in your initial conditions. Right. Okay. So great. So now we have some physically motivated transfer coefficients, and now we can look at. Um, what our attracting behavior looks like for the viscous currents. Um, so, oh, one thing I probably should have mentioned, but I haven't mentioned, but they're here on the plots. Um, this pi over epsilon plus p, omega over um, uh, chi equals pi over epsilon plus p, omega equals pi over epsilon plus p. These are these are your, your respectively your your viscous shear and your viscous bulk pressure. Um, so these were. I guess I should go back really quick over here. Um, this pi over here is is your shear equation, your shear relaxation equation, and this big pi over here is your bulk relaxation equation. Just in case there's any confusion on that, um, that's that's what I mean by chi and omega. And it, it turns out that those are convenient for for finding the attractor because these these are unitless quantities. Um, so these chi and omega are something like your inverse Reynolds number. So chi is like your inverse Reynolds number for your shear, and your omega is like your inverse Reynolds number for your bulk. Okay, so you see that DNMR does admit some attracting like behavior. Um, this, the, the system, however, does not reach equilibrium at late times. And I, we interpret this as a result of this late time rise in shear viscosity as being, um, as being kind of the, the culprit in that. Um, so you see that there actually is then some sensitivity to your initial state if you have this late time rise in shear viscosity. Um, however, of course, this is simplistic study, right? So this isn't um, the end of the this isn't the end of the story, um, but you do seem to have at, at least towards the end of the hydro, you see you seem to have some sort of an, uh, sensitivity to the initial state here. Um, these aren't rescaled by their their respective relaxation times, um, and when you do rescale them by their respective relaxation times, you actually do see them kind of approaching onto a onto a, an attracting like curve. However, but um, they do kind of approach it at different times, as you can you can see here. Right. Uh, so Dieter Mark kind of has this behavior. And Israel Stewart actually hints there's hints that it's more sensitive to the initial state. So you see that there's a wider spread here in your final in your final state here. Um, but they do have this attracting like behavior, which is which is good to see. But it's kind of like somewhere in the middle where it has this attracting like behavior. However, you do seem to have some sensitivity to your initial state as well. Okay. But again, point of emphasis, this is a simplistic study. Um, there are hints that hydro might be sensitive to initial state if the system fails to equilibrate before hydronization. Um, that could be due to a rise in shear viscosity at late times or low temperatures, something like this. Uh, but I want to emphasize the study of this nature must be done in more realistic scenarios if we want to put constraints on the initial state. If we want to see if this is something that we can actually see in experiment, this really would have to be done in more realistic, uh, more realistic scenarios. However, we might ask how far can one push this simplistic model, um, and what changes when we include conserved charges. So once you start talking about conserved charges in, in hydro at um, in heavy ion collisions, you're really talking about um, the beam energy scan because the, the beam energy scan's main objective is to probe the thermal behavior of QCD in a baryon rich regime. Um, so everything we talk about so far has been on the temperature axis, on UB equals zero axis. The idea is that as you lower your beam energy, um, barons will be stopped, right? So some of my protons and my neutrons before they were punching right through each other. Now, instead of punching right through, through each other, some of them get caught and they get caught and they get deposited in that, that deposition of energy that was there before. So you have some, 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 some ball of energy with kind of baryons deposited all around it, right? And as you go lower and lower energy, you would expect more and more baryons to be stopped and you'd expect to be going out further and further into the phase diagram for a, a baryon chemical potential for QCD. And one of the main objectives of the, of the medium energy scan also is to look for the onset of criticality. So whether or not there's a, there's a critical point or and a first order phase transition in the QCD phase diagram is still kind of um, an open question. And all of this physics gets complicated by the lower energies um, because a lot, of the, a lot of this stuff at LHC energies um, um, is, is, is is done by is but done done by uh, QCD calculations at, at higher energy. So how exactly to to initialize the system at these lower energies is also still an open question. There's of course also finite lifetime effects because the system 
only last for so long. So if there, if we, if there is criticality, does it, does it last for long enough for us to even see it in the final state, um, even if the system is close to equilibrium? And then of course there's out of equilibrium effects, right? So there's all these different effects coming to the energy scan that one has to try and surmount to be able to process data and extract from it um, the, the thermal behavior that we're looking for. So, okay, so how can we kind of like encompass all the changes that need to be made as we're going towards the beam energy scan? Well, these, the story of these two heavy ions being Lorentz, uh, Lorentz contracted to pancakes in their lab restroom is no longer strictly true. Actually now um, you have some extent along the beam direction, right? Because they're not going as fast anymore. Right? And this is kind of like this, what leads to baryon stopping. And some work has been done on, on and some, some simplistic models have been done to, to, to incorporate baryon stopping into, into some of these, into some of these um, hybrid models that do the heavy ion collisions. Um, but more work, more work really needs to be done. And um, of course, we also need to figure out how to initialize the full team you knew, which we've already talked about is also a problem at mu b equals zero. The equation is state. Um, this is also an area of need of research for, for uh, going into the beam energy scan. Um, of course, the, the, the QCD, uh, the lat lattice, lattice suffers from the Fermi sign problem if we're trying to, to, to calculate the QCD equation of state from lattice. Uh, so we'll suffer from the, Fermi uh, the Fermi sign problem. Um, there are certain ways around that and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about that later, um, but there's definitely more work that needs to be done there unless someone's going to solve the Fermi sign problem anytime soon, which I don't think that's happening. Um, freeze out is another problem um, that gets complicated as we go to, to, to con as we go to incorporate conserved charges or go to, to explore mu b uh, greater than zero um, because we need to conserve charges locally, not just on average. So, so a lot of the freeze out prescriptions, the, the freeze out prescriptions now uh, conserve charges just on average, because it's, it's 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 not really the central object of study. However, if we want to go to um, if we want to go to to initialize systems that have uh, uh, conserved charges, and we want to study the hydrodynamic effects on those conserved charges, um, then we really need to conserve those charges locally. We really need to see um, um, how they're where they where where the, their response to the hydro is important, and where they end up. Um, before we measure them is important. And we need to conserve, ex to conserve them on, on a local basis so we know where they are and, and measure correlations correctly. Um, and of course, there's out of equilibrium corrections to the freeze out, which are also a problem at mu b equals zero, which I hadn't really talked about, but um, it's good to point out that it's there. Um, and of course, there's a hydro hydro hydrodynamic implementation. So, so now uh, that the system is not um, highly energetic, it no longer has a boost invariance. Uh, so now we really need to do uh, three plus one dimensional hydrodynamics with, with finite conserved charges. Um, and these equations need to be derived and needs to be, and need, and really needs to be implemented if it's going to be a, a full, into a fully dynamic framework. Um, transfer coefficients need to be calculated in this regime. Um, the correct formulation of hydrodynamics, of course, is also something that we can ask about. And, um, and critical fluctuations are also something that needs to be there in, in search of criticality. So the idea is that um, at a critical point, uh, critical fluctuations kind of like encompass the range of your system. Um, and at some point, hydrodynamics really should break down and how to do that correctly um, is also an open is also an open question. So these, so this is only to say that there's a whole list of problems um, going into the beam energy scan. Um, this work kind of is only going to cover some of them and I'm only going to touch on a few different areas of needed research here. Um, but there's 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 tons of open questions. So if you have any ideas, please come join us. Um, right. So what is okay? So now we're going to be talking about the the the, the model that I'm that I'm using. Um, so the in order to explore critic in order to explore the effects of criticality, we need some sort of tool, right? And the point is that we cannot calculate these things on the lattice because of things like the Fermi sign problem, etc. So really, what well, the only thing that we can do is is do some tricks on lattice. So for instance, you can calculate. Uh, you can calculate susceptibilities at mu b equals zero and then Taylor expand to get out a little bit further in chemical potential. And you can get out to about 450 MeV or so um, um, from, from lattice calculations. And then the point is to have a phenomenological tool where we have a parameterized critical point um, in, the, in the universality class that we're expected to see for, for the critical point for QCD. 
Uh, so we use this equation of state here um, by uh, that uh, Paula Parata had a had a large hand in in, in creating. Um, and the idea is to see then how how does this criticality affect our hydrodynamic traversal, right? So ideal hydrodynamics would evolve along isentropic trajectories, right? So any one of these trajectories you see here, these are all isentropes, where S over NB is constant. Your entropy current over your baryon, uh, is, is your baryon number is constant, right? So ideal hydrodynamics would take you along one of these lines. The, the point is to see how do out of equilibrium effects influence these trajectories? What is the effect of criticality on our on our on on the hydro. That was also another question you can ask, right? So now we have kind of an evolving picture of hydrodynamics, right? So without viscous effects, there's no entry production. The system evolves isentropically. Post the equilibrium, the scenario um, uh, might not alter too dramatically if the system is 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 kind of close to equilibrium. The the trajectory might follow closely to an isentrope, or, or but given far from equilibrium far from equilibrium initial conditions. The changes actually uh, might be significant in our traversal through the phase diagram. And one has to keep this in mind because they're actually quite important, right? So what we have here is as a um, constant initial energy density of seven GeV per Fermi, uh, per Fermi cubed, and three different initial baron densities that are here on the plot. And then a bunch of different initial conditions for the, for the, the bulk and the shear uh, viscous currents. And you see here that just given these kind of three equilibrium quantities, you explore a large amount of the phase diagram just by initializing your viscous currents differently. All right, so if you if you assume that you're kind of in a near equilibrium picture where you're where you're evolving close to an isentrope, um, you might get your traversal completely wrong. Right, you might have you might get your your phase diagram traversal completely wrong. Um, because you can end up exploring a large amount of the phase diagram depending on what your initial conditions look like. And the rest of this paper is really going to be about exploring um, what, is, what, is the, what is explicitly the effects of, 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 of these different um, initial conditions and kind of going into more detail on this. So now we're going to be pushing this simple model um, a little bit further. Uh, so we'll take the same hydro equations before. So just for completeness, I included them here. But now we also solve this current, uh, this, uh, this time evolution equation for the baryon current kind of separately on top of everything else. Um, a Bjorken symmetric system, actually, you can have charge diffusion um, just due to the symmetries. So instead, you just have kind of like an ideal current. So basically, just my baryon density initializes what, to whatever it is. And then it just expands with the volume of the system. And um, so your baryon density falls like one over tau. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's dictated by this equation here. So these non-trivial paths in the phase diagram are driven by not only the non-trivial dependence of your epsilon of tau, right? So your epsilon uh, of tau. Sorry, is... may I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 I missed the connection between the far from equilibrium conditions and the isentropic process. Uh, uh, are they related to each other or? So the point, the, so good question, thank you. Um, so the point is that the isentropic process is equilibrium hydro. If, if, okay. your, if, your, if your hydro was ideal, that is no viscous effects, your, 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 your system evolves along an isentrope. However, if I have viscous effects, the trajectory of the phase diagram will be different. And if I'm close to equilibrium, it might not be all that different from an isentropic trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. So something like the picture I have here, this green one kind of like, you know, follows closely the black line, but given initial conditions that are far from equilibrium, right? So large viscous effects in my initial state, right? Given that we have this uncertainty initial state that, that I've kind of been emphasizing, right? There is this large uncertainty initial state, right? So given that we have this large uncertainty initial state, there's no reason to think that we might not have, there's no reason to think that we shouldn't have far from equilibrium conditions you know, right off the bat. and Given that possibility, your trajectories to the phase diagram might be quite different. So you parameterize the initial conditions by different transport coefficient and different ratio of entropy over density ratio. So the transport yes. coefficients actually stay the same. Um, I'll actually, I'll have another slide on the transport coefficients that we use, but they're actually, they're quite similar to the ones that I already showed in the mu b equals zero case. Um, the only difference between all of these different curves is this right here. 
chi is zero, omega is zero, right? So my vi my my initial viscous effects, right? For chi zero and omega are are connected to these pi's here, right? Chi is related to the shear. It's the it's, it's pi over it's the shear over epsilon plus p, and omega is the bulk over epsilon plus p. It's the same thing for these equations, of course, right? The only thing is different how I initialize these. The point is that these are dynamical independent equations in this in this formalism of hydrodynamics. So you can initialize these kind of uh, almost however you see fit. I mean, I put an asterisk there, but you, there's there's a range that you can that you can kind of initialize these, and it's a, and it's okay. It's okay for you to initialize them kind of independently from your system, right? And given that given that freedom, you can get a wide range. In trajectories through the phase diagram, right? So each one, each all three of these points have the same initial energy density, and of course they all have three different baryon de initial baryon densities, right? And the only other two things I have to initialize for my system, given that all my transfer coefficients are fixed and everything, is my viscous part. And vi initialization of my viscous part differently leads to all of these different trajectories. So that's the point. The out of equilibrium effects are really are what the, the out of equilibrium effects are really what what are what are deviating you from the isentropic trajectories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Okay. So as I was saying, these and and so just to now transition back that so exactly those non-trivial paths are is 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 driven by the non-trivial dependence of your energy density as a function of time because of course. Your energy density as a function of time is, is going to be affected by um, um, what your viscous currents are doing. And also the non-trivial mapping between epsilon rho and TMUB because this is a non-linear equation of the state. So that also complicates things as well. Um, so that's really how we interpret where this behavior is coming from. Why, is, why, are we able to, why are we able to see this sort of thing? So as I was also saying, the, the transfer coefficients are quite similar to the previous study. And here I actually have a, a plot of the shear viscosity um, as a function of temperature for different values of chemical potential. Um, you see that our shear viscosity actually doesn't have um, sensitivity to criticality explicitly. Um, explicitly, so keep that in mind, not explicitly. We didn't put anything in by hand, any, any critical sensitivity here. And the bulk viscosity, so this is actually your bulk viscosity as a function of time away from the critical point, not as a function of temperature, but as a function of time, different, um, different uh, hydro runs. Every line is a different hydro run. And the bulk viscosity kind of away from the critical point doesn't really show critical scaling behavior. It just kind of like um, mimics, it looks really similar to the bulk viscosity that, that I showed previously for the mu b equals zero case, which is good. That's what we want. So we don't really want it to be affected if it's away from the critical point. However, close to the critical point, there are reasons to suspect that the bulk viscosity actually should be affected. Um, so I won't get too much into it here, but there are reasons to think that the, the bulk viscosity should scale, uh, should scale something like the correlation length to the third power. Um, so this correlation length is important in the concept of criticality um, because it's the length at which um, particles are correlated in your system. Uh, so when we talk about hydrodynamic fluctuations earlier, this is really what I'm talking about, right? It's the correlation length going to infinity. So the fluctuations scale over your entire system. Um, in this work, we didn't have any hydrodynamic fluctuations, which we, we uh, critical fluctuations, which we, which we know need to be there, but there's kind of a lot of work that needs to be done there. So we kind of took this as a first step as just incorporating, instead of, instead of incorporating the, the critical fluctuations, we only inc incorporate the scaling that the bulk viscosity should see due to the correlation length, just to kind of, as a first step to see what happens. We saw that away from the critical point, there was no effect and only has effect from the speed of sound, but here close to the critical point. So all these runs were done close to the critical point. And you see that there is an effect of critical scaling and, and your zeta t or w kind of, kind of peaks at about one here. So your bulk viscosity peaks at about one. Um, so this correlation length is actually calculated in a linear parameterization model. Um, that's really all I'll say about that. The details of that aren't too interesting, um, but we can talk more about that if you want to. So the point is now that we have a systematic formulation comparison, right? So again, we're running DNMR in Israel Stewart, just like I showed in the previous slide. And the idea is now going to be to run many different hydro events and systematically scan through my initial conditions, the same way we've been doing before. And so instead of, instead of just uh, instead of just you know going 
um, initializing a bunch of different ones and seeing how wide of a swath I pass through in the phase diagram. Now um, we're going to kind of systematically run through them and only select on events that pass through the same freeze out points, right? So the, um, the idea is that we can get some freeze out points kind of like uh, inspired by experiments. Um, so in experiments, particle yields kind of tell us uh, what the system will look like at freeze out, right? So we can measure particle yields, we can measure fluctuations from event to event in the particle yields and kind of get a good idea about what the system, how this, uh, or what temperature the system was point before it froze out and then eventually just free streamed in here detector, right? The point is that in this case, we select on events that uh, pass through that same freeze out, freeze out point. And um, so it's kind of like, and we, we, we use ideal hydra as our base of comparison because we use the, uh, the, the, the freeze out point is taken along an isentropic trajectory, if that makes sense. So hopefully with this plot, all of that makes a little bit more sense. Um, this green line here is what you would get if you ran ideal hydro. These green lines are your equilibrium hydro trajectories. These are the isentropes that, I was, that I've been talking about. These are isentropes uh, where, where entropy to baryon number remains constant. Uh, the ratio of entropy and baryon number remains constant. Um, and you see the point is that at freeze out, we kind of arbitrarily choose a freeze out temperature in this case for our, for our purposes. We kind of arbitrarily choose a temperature freeze out about um, to be about 140, 150 MeV or so. Um, and we only select on trajectories that pass through that same, that same freeze out point, right? So here is Israel Stewart on the left and here's DNMR runs on the right. Um, so, and of course we have the labels for the isentropes there as well. Um, the point, the main takeaways from these plots, right? Is that one might be pushed to or away from the critical point on an event by event basis, right? Actually, you could have taken that point away from the first plot that I showed, but you can take that point away from here as well. Um, one might be pushed to or away from the critical point on an event by event basis. Um, another important point is the degeneracy of the final state mapping to the initial state, right? because since all of these states pass through the final, the same final freeze out point, um, will they look the same to us in the detector? I mean, that's, that's an open question, but I mean, certainly this study hints that they might, right? And then of course we, in that case, if, if the system looks like it froze out exactly the same way in all of these cases, for, uh, in all these different cases here, for all these different initial conditions here, right? Then how do we know what the initial conditions were? There's a degeneracy in the mapping of the final state to the initial state. And one last important takeaway actually is that DNMR seems a little bit more robust than Israel Stewart, right? So you see here that there, I wouldn't really, <laughs> I wouldn't really trust any of these these paths over here at the end for sure, right? Because it just it it, it seems like these are some runaway solutions, right? But DNMR seems a lot more robust. Um, the, the solutions are a lot more tighter and seems to be less susceptible to kind of um, uh, nu uh, numerical stuff or maybe more robust to larger gradients is another way to put it. Uh, so I also mentioned that there is no explicit effects on shear viscosity. Um, so we see here that there is some craziness going on with Israel Stewart. Um, if your system does do something crazy, then it's possible that you might have some implicit critical effects on your shear viscosity, depending on what your traversal to the phase diagram looks like. Because remember, the shear viscosity is a function of your, your temperature and your chemical potential. Um, but this is really related to, to instabilities in Israel Stewart. So it's kind of an open question as to whether or not you would really see this in a system that would look a little bit more stable. Um, but these are hints that, that your shear viscosity could see some critical effects if your critical, um, if your, if your, your, your sensitivity to critical behavior is sending you towards some weird trajectories in the phase diagram, you might end up having some weird trajectories in your, that your hydro sees for your shear viscosity, right? So the point is that at the end of the day, your, your shear viscosity as a function of temperature and chemical potential is not, uh, is not going to be what the hydro um, sees in a sense. I mean, it is going to be, it's what it sees in a sense, but as a function of time, it, it, it carves out a certain slice, right? So. So the, the actual behavior of the function of time might look really different than the behavior of the shear viscosity just in, in, as a function of TMUB, right? Which is an important point. Okay, so now to look at some, what we call potential attractors. Um, here we have like kind of these little arrows to try and show you, because um, it's hard to see, 
right? Because because we can't we didn't involve hydro all the way until these things collapse onto a point or a curve, right? But it does look like if you look at these arrows at the end, which are the direction of the derivative um, at the final time step, that they're kind of all converging onto a curve here for the DNMR case. Also for the DNMR case here, close to the critical point. So this is far, this is close to the critical point. So in both cases, they're kind of converging onto a line. But notice again that the system is remaining out of equilibrium by the end of it. And again, this is probably uh, can be uh, this is probably attributed to the um, the rise in shear viscosity at late times due to the to, due to the dip in temperature. Um, in the Israel Stewart case, we see something similar in the in the far from the critical point case, right, where all these things are kind of like lining up on a on a, on a universal curve. But actually, when you get to the critical point, Israel Stewart kind of breaks down. I wouldn't really trust this. I wouldn't really say that these are trustworthy hydro runs. This is only to say that Israel Stewart is not really doing well um, in handling the critical behavior. Of the, of, of the system, right? Omega is kind of a different story, um, which, is, which was interesting because Omega really in a sense should be, have been more sensitive to the critical point you would think because this bulk, right, is more sensitive to the bulk viscosity than the shear. However, you see that the trajectories collapse kind of better in a way than they did for the, for the, for the, for the case for Kai. Uh, for the case with the shear, and even in the case where Israel Stewart is close to the critical point, you know some of these behave really badly, and then still the solution comes back and comes back onto the curve. So in that sense, um, the omega at least seems at least seems ro robust in that sense, even for Israel Stewart, which is which is quite interesting. But you could see the effects of critical scaling even in the DNMR case as the system sees passes through the critical points of this. So then you know here then about at one Fermi or so, or about oh not one Fermi, but about one step. And it's a uh, and it's scaled and it's scaled time. It passes through the critical point right around here. You can see that effect, which is also quite interesting. Um, so the point is that these potential attractors still kind of exist, but we kind of lose the information in the omega condition uh, in the omega uh, in the omega uh, solutions. But the, the the chi solutions might still happen. Sorry, may I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I have a question about the uh, critical point and far from critical point behavior. Um, what do you expect about the difference of this pattern? Since it seems naturally that um, they have to have different behavior or different asymptotic uh, patterns, but in these figures, I don't have any any a reliable or clear difference between uh, figures. Uh, uh, does it relate to your initial conditions or other things? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. Um, are you saying something like, what kind of behavior would I have expected? Yes, um, yes. Prior to uh, doing the study? Yes, yes. Um, since uh, um, I think that critical point have to um, have to have some um, a different behavior or different patterns uh, can be seen from approaching to the critical point. Uh, but in the right panel and the left panel, uh, there is no any um, brilliant or a sharp difference between the, these figures. So, I mean, I, I mean, I would say that there's, in my opinion, I think there's quite a difference, for instance, between the, this figure and this figure. I mean, these look quite different to me. Um, however, if you're asking whether or not this is the correct critical point behavior, I would say, no, I mean, we're missing things. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm not even sure how much sense it makes to have a critical point in a Bjorken in a system with Bjorken symmetry, right? And um, maybe that's not something that, you know, really makes sense. Um, on top of that, we're also missing critical fluctuations, which we know should be there. I mean, at some point, hydrodynamics should break down, right? In the vicinity of a critical point, we know that all that is true. Um, this is really was just a, a first kind of phenological step in like seeing what the hydro might do if we put in one effect of criticality, which was the scaling bulk viscosity. And also seeing how the effects of criticality couple to the initial conditions, right? So we see here um, are, are the shear um, in a sense, well, 
but coupling to the initial conditions wasn't necessarily not even, and it doesn't have to be an effect of criticality, which we saw in the first case at mu b equals zero, right? At mu b equals zero, see that the, 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 the final state solutions um, given, you know, something like a large, just given like a rising shear viscosity, we see the final state solutions um, have some kind of uh, sensitivity to your initial state, right? Um, and the question was whether or not that kind of thing proceeds in the case where I go to finite barrier densities and, and how it changes, right? So you can kind of get a feel for that by looking at your system far from the critical point. So this is far from the critical point in the sense that there is a finite barrier in density, but it's not, it's your system should not be seeing criticality, right? So that's, that's uh, one thing you can do. And then close to the critical point, you can start to see not only how your system at finite barrier densities couples or, or, or reacts to different initial conditions, but also how those initial conditions matter for your critical point traversal, and also how your hydro just responds to um, a bulk viscosity that scales critically as you pass through it, right? Because, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the answer for the hydro, right? Because, I mean, it can't be, right? But I'm saying that there are some effects here to keep in mind as we're going forward, things to start, to start talking about. I mean, this is really more of an effort to start a conversation than it is to, you know, describe uh, the critical dynamics of the QGP, right? So I don't know if that all answers your question. Uh, thank you. Yes, I get my point. Okay, great. Hi, sorry. I also have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears> How <throat> here is the time? Sorry? So the, the horizontal axis, uh, you show the tau over tau pi. Is this uh, the time, time axis? It's, yeah, this is the time, yeah. Uh, so, 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 tau, so, so this is rescale time. So the tau pi is is, real, is the bulk relaxation time, and the tau is is the is the time like coordinate for for uh, for for Bjork. I mean, not the time so, like coordinate. I'm sure the, the the lifetime actually. How come uh, some of the trajectory is bent to the left? Because it's rescaled. So 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 yeah yeah yeah. So that's a good question. So 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 this is actually okay. So to answer that, I actually have to go to one of my backup sides. Uh, I have here actually my only backup slide. Uh, so your 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 relaxation times is actually the relaxation times that we use, right? So something like your tau pi, um, it uh, so for instance your 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 relaxation for your bulk is is going to be dependent on your bulk viscosity, right? But if my bulk viscosity increases, right? If it increases at a larger size, for instance, as I go through the critical point, my bulk viscosity is going to diverge in this model because we put that in by hand, right? then my tau pi gets extremely large as the system goes through the critical point. Now, if we go back here, that's going to take you back, right? Because it's tau over tau pi. So of course, yeah, time is going forward, right? But if now my tau pi starts to get uh, really large, then you see that there's something like it coming back here. And the same thing happens over here in the chi case, right? Like at late times, at late times, tau pi gets large, right? So you see that there's a turn, the whole system kind of turns back, right? As tau pi starts scaling faster than the time, right? So if tau and tau pi scale like at the same rate, of course, you know, you can't ever go back, right? If tau pi scales slower than, than the time, then of course it's gonna look like kind of like the system is moving faster in a sense. And if tau pi scales faster than the time, then you're gonna see it kind of turning back like that, right? So it's not exactly, so when I say it's a time, it's not, it's really the rescaled time, right? So it's, it's actually can be interpreted as something, in, in Bjork and flow, it can actually be interpreted as something like the Knudsen number. Thanks. Thanks. Great. All right, any other questions? These are fantastic questions. Thank you for asking them. Okay, so I guess that kind of, really those kind of were the main results of the paper. Um, I think I, I said most of the main points that I wanted to drive home. Um, so I have about 10 minutes left or so, which cool. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to take that long. I'm glad I have time. So let's start talking about the next steps. So, right. Cause we want actually at the end of the day, we really, so, I mean, I was getting some, some stick for, for, for having not a very realistic model, right. At the end of the day, we do want a realistic model, right. So what are the next steps to going towards beam energy scan hydrodynamics? Um, well, okay. I mean, it's a, it's a, as, as you saw in one of my previous slides, it's a tall order, right? There's a lot of things that need to be done going towards the beam energy scan that, that aren't done yet that we need to start doing. Um, but one thing that we can try to start doing is, is, is starting with what we know already, right? We, we think we have LHC energies, LHC energies down pretty well, barring, you know, some 
some caveats, but we, we, we think we have, you know, lead lead at five TV down pat pretty well. Um, so what's something that we can do? Well, we might have uh, uh, zero net density, right? In total net density. However, that's, that's like the mean field value, right? And like, you might have some fluctuations around that. Locally, you can have fluctuations around that. And icing is a, is a method to kind of implement those. So, so the next step really is going to be kind of initializing and serve charges at zero net density. And for that, we, we, we require a two plus one hydrodynamics. So here we're gonna use the SPH and USB hydro and a, a, four, a four dimensional equation of state. Um, so this four dimensional equation of state is kind of like a, uh, gives us a mapping between epsilon and all the, the BQS charge densities to T and the chemical potentials. So let's talk a little bit more about icing. Um, try and, and I actually part of these slides, the next, this slide and the next one from, from Matt Sievert, who is uh, Matt Sievert, who is um, one, of the, one of the people on the collaboration for, for this icing. So kind of in a nutshell, what is it? Well, basically you have some input energy, initial energy density, right? So, some some energy density that looks like this after after you deposit after uh, after the lead lead kill each other they deposit all these gluons right then you have some means of sampling this energy density right so so um, or, or uh, right so you have some means of sampling this energy density and turning it and 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 taking some some piece of this energy density and turning it into a a, a, a pair of, of 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 quarks right so an up and an up and an anti up, a down and an anti and an anti down, something like this, right? And your output ends up being some energy density um, that's missing some pieces, right? So my epsilon, my e prime here is some energy density that's missing some pieces that I sampled. And uh, you run through some Monte Carlo algorithm and sample these things, and you end up also with BSQ charge densities, right? So, um, and I'm giving kind of a short speech here because I'm not going into too much of the details of it. But the point is that you end up something like this, right? I have some energy density left over where I sampled out pieces here. So you can kind of see the remnants, these little circles here, you can see the remnants of, of little pieces that I sampled to produce some charge densities, right? So I sample, I produce some, some baryon density here, some baryon density here, some strange density, some charge density, right? And this offers us a means to, to, to study, uh, conserve charges um, at LHC where, where we know things best and kind of try and put in, um, try and see how charges diffuse. Um, in a in when in in a, in in a, in, a, in a system where we where we know things really well, right? Okay, so yeah, moving a little bit forward. So so smooth particle hydrodynamics. I mentioned that VUSB hydro is a is a is a hydro um, is a is a hydrodynamic um, model that uses smooth particle hydrodynamics. There's two main approximations. Um, you first of all you coarse grain um, uh, you you coarse grain your system. With a with 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 what's called a what's called a smoothing function, this W here. Um, oh, I forgot to put the source here. I actually got this off Wikipedia, so it actually has a nice little article on smooth particle hydrodynamics. If you're interested, um, basically every single one of these blue points here can be can be considered something like a hydrodynamic cell, right? So you represent uh, your system with a, with some some number of SPH particles. So each one of these is kind of like a fluid cell, and then you smooth over these fluid cell with this with this weight here, and actually. Um, and, and heavy ions, uh, since kind of since since um, since it's 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 we don't have since mass, for instance, is not conserved, right? Um, and it's kind of like it's it's ambiguous as to what you're really. Uh, oh, oops, it's kind of ambiguous as to which charge you should use as kind of like your your charge reference density. Actually, you for heavy ions, we actually make up a a, a conserved fluid cell volume. Uh, we, we make up a conserve uh, make up a conserved quantity, and we actually take the the fluid cell volume to be to be conserved for each for each one of these blue dots, right? And so that any local quantity can kind of be expressed as a sum over a weighted sum using this smoothing function over all of the different SPH particles. And then this is kind of like the the, the approximation scheme as to what and how you do um, as how you do um, um, the hydro. And then every the function of time for every SPH cell. Is is actually built into built into this equation here, All right? So that's just kind of in a nutshell. Um, but the important point is keep is that you have to keep track of this reference density, right? If you take away anything from it, just take away from the fact that SPH has this reference density, and it's something that you have to keep track of, right? So if I have a simple relaxation type equation for my bulk, for instance, right? Um, if I kind of do this now in an SPH setting, um, I instead of taking a time derivative of just a bulk, I actually have to take the time derivative of the bulk over, over weighted by uh, one over sigma, weighted by the reference density, right? Um, 
and that gives you an extra term, right? So then this extra term is, is unique to SPH and it kind of can be interpreted as like a finite size effect for your, for your fluid cell. So it's actually, it's really physical. It has a very physical interpretation and there's a sense, a sense in which it really should be there. Um, so the, the point is that when you do things in SPH, you kind of have extra terms that you have to keep track of, um, but there's physics in those extra terms. It's not like it's not like it's a, it's just ad hoc or something, right? And also if we're going to be doing uh, um, diffusion for BSQ, well, we know that um, if I have particles uh, moving around, we know that certain, uh, for instance, hadrons can carry um, um, both, you know, bearing number, stranges, and charge, right? So the point is that the diffusion that we see actually has has a, has uh, the ability to be coupled, right? So if I diffuse baryons, I'm not just diffusing baryons, but I'm also diffusing in some sense strangeness and in some sense uh, electric uh, electric charge, right? Uh, so there's a wonderful paper here. Um, uh, by Jan, uh, with Jan Patakis and collaborators, where they where they derive kind of well they don't derive these equations they kind of uh, they kind of uh, posit this equation um, for for coupled diffusion and derive uh, these kappa QL coefficients from one one sense from kinetic theory and another sense just from a parameterization and just to see what hydro to hydro changes when you turn on um, coupled diffusion and you can see here that there are some significant changes when you turn on the full diffusion matrix rather than just baryon diffusion or no diffusion at all. Um, the baryon diffusion uh, doesn't change all that much, but the, str uh, the strangeness one certainly does, right? So they initialize only baryon here, and then you end up getting um, strangeness distributions and rapidity, for instance. Um, so it's a nice paper. I definitely recommend that as well. Um, so the idea then is to do the same thing for full Israel Stewart. So with BSQ coupled diffusion, in SPH with those extra SPH turns. And then this is kind of what you get out. Um, so I wanna stress that this wasn't calculated. So these equations here were not calculated in the kinetic theory sense. So we didn't do kinetic theory, but actually we took the phenomenological approach um, that Israel Stewart take in their paper where they, where they derived the relaxation time, where they derived the relaxation equations for the viscous currents. Um, they derived them by, by ensuring positive definite entry reproduction. So we take the same approach here, but instead of inserting a uh, positive entry production, we actually uh, uh, um, um, take, into, take into account sigma, right? We take into account the reference density. And when you do that, you get kind of some extra terms here. Um, so this is kind of going towards the future, uh, implementing this. These are the equations that will be implemented into um, VUSB Hydro um, quite soon, hopefully, actually. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, right, so here's my conclusion slide, and I guess I'm a couple minutes early, which is cool. I thought that I might not have enough time, but I guess I can talk for longer than I thought. Um, so there's a lot of theoretical work to be done on modeling uh, the, the, for the beam energy scan 2 that's coming up. I mean, the hydro formulation comparison is one area. Um, the studying critical fluctuations is another area. I mean, there's, there's so much work to be done um, that that, I mean, this study was, was, was the study emphasized here was, was really not physical, right? But I think the important point is to start the conversation about what these effects are, because I, I don't think people are really talking about these effects. Um, these results show that DNMR may offer more robust solutions when the, when the system exhibits criticality. There's a sense in which you would expect that just from the way that the equations are derived. Um, if you're interested in that, because I could, I could tell you something about that too, but I don't think there's any reason to go into that right now, but there's a reason you would, you would have suspect the DNMR to have done better anyway, and it showed that it did. Um, and also uh, future work will be studying these charge views and LHC energy. So keep your eye out for this. Our group's working hard on getting um, BSQ Hydro at LHC energies working pretty soon and getting papers out soon on that if you're interested in that as well. So kind of a means to control study um, for, before moving on to three plus one BSQ. BSQ Hydro, can we put constraints on the BSQ diffusion that we see already at MUB? All right, well, thanks so much for your time. And if you have any questions or anything to talk about, I'd be happy to talk or answer them. But that's all I got. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I have some questions myself, but uh, first I will go to the audience to see if there is a question, please. If you have a question, raise you your hands. I think there is a question in the chat. Uh, 
Ah, but some of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone, someone, do you want to ask your question yourself or do you want me to read it? Yeah, uh, so uh, in your uh, team you plot, uh, you uh, show this uh, variation with row. Uh, do you fix that row by uh, changing the chemi- the chemical potentials? So the chemical potentials are fixed by choosing rho. So the hydrodynamic variables in principle are epsilon, rho, um, and, and these and these the viscous effects, right? right? So actually, we initialize system by choosing epsilon and by choosing rho, but that does also fix a TMUB, right? Because we have an equation right. state that takes this in. So yeah. OK. Uh, another question is uh, in a couple of slides uh, after this, uh, you sh- show something a uh, critical scaling and no critical scaling. Uh, can you explain what that means, uh, critical scaling? Um, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't talk too much about this. Um, what, what, so so, so the, the, the point is that the bulk viscosity for, for certain reasons uh, we believe should scale with the correlation length um, near, uh, uh, near criticality. Right, and it should scale with a with a power like this, right, to the third. So the core. Oh, okay. Is, so this correlation then. Okay. Yeah. Um. So that that's the critical scaling that that I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. This is this is this is the way that we incorporated really incorporated critical effects. This is this is honestly yeah, yeah. the only way that critical effects show up in our model is, is, right. is through this bulk viscosity. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. May I? Sure. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. Um, I have a question. So I see that uh, your visco stresses sometimes be, become very large because it's far from equilibrium. Mm-hmm. And as far as I know, Israel Stewart can become unstable when you are sufficiently far from equilibrium. It has been verified. Uh, can may this explain the pathologies you observe? No, I think I think it does, um, and I, I think that that's part of the motivation for looking at different formulations for hydrodynamics, right? Because if we do expect the system to to behave hydrodynamically, there is there is some set of hydrodynamic exqu- equations that it should that should work, right? Um, so so that is one explanation for the pathology the pathologies that we see for Israel Stewart is exactly that, right? And that's part of why DNMR does better is because uh, there's a sense in which DNMR has has kind of like more information uh, from kinetic theory, right? Um, so I'm not sure if, if you want to know more about that, but there's a sense in which DNMR kind of should have been more robust from the beginning. Um, and DNMR is an Israel Stewart-like formulation of hydrodynamics. Like these, these theories are very similar, but DNMR does in some sense have more. Uh, so it's not surprising that Israel Stewart broke down but also, I, I really want to keep in mind that it's not just the viscous effects that are that are that are forcing kind of your system. Well, okay, in this sense, it is just the viscous effects because the, the the only effect from criticality we put is this, right? But in principle, you should also have critical critical fluctuations, which will also uh, uh, mess up your hydro, which should also force a breakdown of your hydro, right? So here we kind of mimic that by putting in large viscous effects, right? But really. Any system, any hydrodynamic system that passes the critical point should suffer a breakdown of hydro as it goes through, you know, close to the critical region because we know these effects from critical fluctuations should be there and they, they, they mess with all of your scales. Hydrodynamics is really a theory of scales, right? It's, you, it's, it's, a, it's a mesoscopic regime. There's, it's some regime where it's, it's still a many body problem, right? There's still like a macroscopic system that I'm describing, right? But somehow like I'm not sensitive to the exact microscopics Exactly, right? So it's kind of a mesoscopic regime and the, the scaling structure is, has to be there for hydrodynamics to work. But when you have critical fluctuations, your scalings get all kind of messed up in a sense, right? So that's an intuitive way to think about it. So really they, 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 the hydro should break down at the critical point for numerous reasons. One reason is because the bulk viscosity should scale, uh, should really kind of diverge with the, uh, in a sense, with the correlation length. Um, but also because those critical fluctuations should be there. Um, but yeah, you're right. Israel Stewart is is not. I mean, it's 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 not going to handle these large gradients really well. Not not nearly as well as, as DNMR would, as you can see here. Uh, no, th- this is okay, clear. I understand it. But there is also really a, a mechanism according to which when you reach 
some particular displacement from equilibrium, so particular large value of something, if the equation of state is not enough uh, good, uh, I mean, if uh, your parameters are not tuned in the proper way, then at one point the system prefers going far away from equilibrium than close to it. Mm. So this was the mechanism that Ishkok and Lindblom have discovered. And actually, uh, in a recent paper, I've also proposed a way of uh, checking how when this happens in an mm. easier way. So an interesting thing would be to see if uh, maybe in some of these solutions it happens that at one point you reach that critical uh, stress those critical stresses yeah. at which the system wants to go away from equilibrium instead uh, of approaching it that's a that's a fantastic point and I, I, I would love to talk to you about that further um maybe you could send me an email or, or or something but that's a fantastic point because the transport coefficients that we use here are so 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 i had a slide where i said the transport coefficients are something that we need to work on going towards towards uh towards a beam energy scan and honestly those are really uh in a sense even at mu b equals zero they're not the transport coefficients that you that we in a sense should really be using i mean the the transport coefficients that we that it's used i mean and this is used on any of the any of the hydro that you see in the market for for discuss for, for describing heavy ion collisions um the transport coefficients are calculated in the regime of, of weakly coupled system, right? So it's calculated mm -hmm. in a regime of a, uh, uh, most of them are calculated in a weakly coupled uh, system with um, with conformal symmetry. Some of them are not, but people kind of mix and match which one they use sometimes. Um, but yeah, so so I, I wouldn't expect these transfer coefficients to work well in the system. And if, if what you're saying is true, so I hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't known that. And that that might be another reason to explain exactly why you know this behavior is happening and maybe if we put in you know if one could go and and, and calculate the correct transfer coefficients from qcd in this regime for the because the equation of state i'm using is really qcd right and so what you're saying is there's a tension between your equation of state and the transfer coefficients you use um and in this case i think that tension is really manifest because the equation of state i'm using is really kind of like a qcd equation of state right for the most part except for the Except for the criticality that's put in by hand, for the most part, it's it's really a QCD equation of state, uh, and at, at these temperatures, you would expect this coupling to be strong, right? So as you go through the transition, you expect the coupling to 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 be to be not necessarily be like asymptotically free, right? Um, and I think that a lot of these transfer coefficients are are for uh, yeah for for a weakly coupled for a weakly coupled system. So I would I would love to talk more to you about that. Ah, if you're interested, I can send you an email with a little bit more details uh, explaining to you the easy way of testing this kind of stuff to understand it. So, perfect. Okay. Please. <laughs> Rajiv, please go on. Uh, sorry for my very, very nice question. Uh, I see that uh, it's a center of mass energy you're giving is 27 GeV, right? Uh, In the plus. Uh, the center of mass energy, uh, 27 GeV you have given in the plots. Ah, um, yeah. yeah. So what so, happens bef what, when we go below or above uh, this GeVs, 27 um, GeV? Great. No, no, honestly, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so this, this really, this 27 GeV center mass energy is really to give an idea of the kind of, of so this is in a sense away from the critical point, right? And this this kind of like uh, it's really to give an idea of the trajectory that our our system is is taking as compared to heavy ions. Um, I wouldn't really. It's hard to make a direct comparison here, exactly yes. right. Um, but I would I would say that everything that goes through a critical point is at some hypothetical lower beam energy. So the the point is that for the beam energy scan, as you decrease your beam energy, your system deposits more and more baryons. So you're getting further and further out into the phase diagram for chemical potential, right? Um, so the point here saying 27 GeV is because we already have actually, we have done measurements on that. And it turns out that it's not that, that, that the freeze out indicates that we did not get too close to the critical point actually, right? So if you look at uh, here, right? So, so, so these isentropes here, these green isentropes on both of these are kind of their, your 27 GeV isentropes, right? So if, my my system in QGP evolved um, ideally, right? So using ideal hydrodynamics or something like this, this would be the trajectory that it would follow. And this kind of freeze out point is like the freeze out point that you get for an ideal system 
at 27 GeV in a sense, center, a center mass energy. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Um, yes, yeah, thank you. The connection isn't exactly there, but. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So if there is no other question, I wanted to ask two questions. They are not very sophisticated questions, actually. But you were talking about the isentropic trajectory and uh, viscose effects. And you said that the viscose trajectory is not very uh, far from the isentropic trajectory, yeah? Um, which one? So it depends on which viscous trajectory you're looking at, but but here, I mean, here on these plots, the green ones are the isentropes and every other line is a viscous trajectory. Not here, I think the one before that. So uh, this one, I, I don't think, I actually didn't plot any, I didn't plot any isentropes on this one. Uh, yeah, before the exactly before this slide. Ah, we had some, uh, yes, this was a somehow a cartoon, but uh, I was, I was thinking, is that closeness related to the lack of charge diffusion or not? Mm. Um. I haven't really thought about it. And in a sense, I guess it can be as long as as long as your um as long as your 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 entropy isn't as long as you're not producing too much entropy either. Right. But in but in a sense that's true, right? So like if if I have, you know, if I have a system that uh doesn't that the gradients in in my in my in my in my charge density aren't very large and it's not going to diffuse a lot, right? Also, yeah. then it's not going to have that much viscous effects, right? So if I have a system that's initiated close to equilibrium, right, it, charge doesn't diffuse that much, heat doesn't diffuse as much, all of these things, right? So, so I mean, in a sense, yes, I, I won't have too much entry production, and I also won't have too much diffusion, for instance, for my charges or for my heat or, or for whatever else. So I guess, yeah, in a sense, that, that makes sense. I hadn't really thought about it like that, but I, I think that's true. But I, th I, th I think that the opposite may all also be true. Because if you take S over N, and now, uh, since you're not having any charge diffusion, the S is changed. The S is changed in the pure, for example, in the Björken case, from the ideal Björken case. But if N also changes, we don't know that if this is, this gets you farther from the isentropic trajectory or closer to it. Yeah, so, 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 so I get your point. Um, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that if my char if I don't have a lot of charge diffusion, right, then really my n my my baryon density is really just going to decrease with the volume, right? So you think that if I have you know a system that's expanding without any charge diffusion. Um, that means that there had to be really no gradients in my charge, right? Mm -hmm. that, that when my system expands, if there's still no gradients, then the density is just falling as the volume rises. Right? So something like Bjorken, right? Just, and Bjorken just, yeah. will just fall like one over tau, right? S also falls like one over tau in the ideal case. Yeah. Right? So in the ideal case, both these things fall like one over tau. And that's why it remains constant. If you don't go too far away from equilibrium, the baryon density will diffuse, right? So it won't evolve like one over tau. It will evolve something differently, right? And the entropy might also evolve differently, evolve differently, but they don't have to, and they don't, also they don't have to evolve the same way. They won't evolve the same way differently. However, if they're not too far away from equilibrium, they can't change all that much regardless, right? So yeah. if you're not too far away from equilibrium, yeah, like, I mean, your entropy and your baryon density can change in weird ways, but if you're really close to equilibrium, they really can't change all that much because you're really close to equilibrium. 
But if you're mm-hmm. far, the point is that, that that's why your trajectory is going to look weird, right? So maybe that's another way of seeing the point that I'm making is that your trajectory looks weird far from equilibrium because now they can change in non-trivial ways and they, they change a lot in non-trivial ways, right? Because I guess, well, in this case, your bearing density, it's Bjorken, right? So your bearing density is really, is really always one over tau because it's Bjorken. But my entropy can change in non-trivial ways that leads to this in a sense, right? So that, I mean, that is something we emphasize in the paper too, is that another way to understand these trajectories is really to understand them through entropy production. Uh, I have another question. What the inverse Reynolds number that you have? Um, that, that's, um, we, we, call, we call the pi and, and omega the inverse Reynolds number. So we call chi, oh, I'm sorry, we call chi and omega. So this chi here is, a, is the ratio of shear to the enthalpy. And we call this the, the inverse Reynolds number for pi. And this omega here is the ratio of your bulk pressure to your enthalpy. And we call that the inverse Reynolds number for omega. But of course, these are not unique. I mean, there's, there's a lot of inverse Reynolds numbers that you can define, right? And these are just what we define and we just call these. However, it is very interesting that the DNMR is working well but then when the Reynolds number is small. Hmm. Does it? I mean, the DNMR is an expansion in both Knudsen number and inverse Reynolds number. Yeah? That's true. That's true. But yeah. it seems that from your results that it is work, working well with a small Reynolds number. Oh, so when I say, right. oh, I'm sorry, uh, I wasn't clear. These, these are we call these the inverse Reynolds number, right? So it should work well when it's an inverse Reynolds number. Yeah. Yeah. This, this will, uh, yeah. Okay. So this is the, the in that approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so but yeah. So, so maybe you anticipated like, this is, that. This is not the Reynolds number. This is the yeah. I guess I, I said that wrong. This is the inverse Reynolds number. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So 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 this is what you would expect to be small when DNMR works. Uh. My last question was about BD and K. Ah. Do you think that you can use BD and K in this case, at least in one plus one dimensions? I would because like to. You can... um, yes. that's, that's, a, no, that's a great question. It's something I thought uh, about. I mean, in the uncharged part. Say that again, I'm sorry. I mean, in the uncharged part, because we don't know yeah. the. No, exact actually, I, I think, they, I think there is there is some work done on the charge part. Um, uh, the student of I think the student of Pavel actually uh, did his master's thesis just on putting charges into it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's conformal. Oh yes, that's true. Yeah, it is conformal. You're right. That's true. Um, yeah. So so I guess okay. So one would have to do this uncharged. So in the uncharged regime, the maybe zero regime, you could do a study like this. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to do something like that. Um, of course, George is at Illinois as well, so. Which is you know the, the N and BDNK. So one thing we could do is talk to him about how to do something similar. Of course, the degrees of freedom are different, right? I mean, in BDNK, yeah. these things are not independent dynamical, you know, viscous currents, right? Um, so so the way you initialize a system is different. Um, so whether or not you could see something like this, it might it might depend on on. I mean, maybe you could do something like comparing the different hydrodynamic frames. And seeing how the different hydro frames give you different trajectories, yeah, that to me could be very interesting, right? So, uh, Travis, so so George actually does have a paper out already at Finite Mu B with diffusion from this, really? yeah, 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 awesome. Um, and that's a non-conformal one. Awesome. So, wow, I did not know that. That's yeah, great. yeah, I think it just came out recently. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Does, does he does he non-conformal? So, what equation of state does he use? No, no, I mean, I don't think he's doing anything like this. He just derives the equations. Oh, he just derives the equations. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So then so if that's pretty- there, then mm-hmm. fantastic. Then that's something that we can do in the near future. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, we'd have to have one plus one or, or more dimensions yeah. to do yeah, yeah. diffusion, but yeah. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. If there is no other question, uh, I would like to thank Travis for this very interesting talk and also thank Professor Norneal Hustler for recommending him as a speaker.
and also thank all of you for being with us this year and happy Christmas everyone and have a very very good new year uh, we will see you again in the next year okay I stop the recording oh. yeah th thanks a lot for having me I really enjoy giving